All right, two minutes late, but we got it all worked out. Thank you all for coming in today. I know it's, uh, um, it's a great show, and uh, thank you for taking the time to show up uh, for this. And I also want to be sure that I thank Blade for allowing me to have this opportunity to, uh, to talk with you guys today and gals. And, um, but I got to say, uh, I got to bring this up. This morning uh, on my internet on one of the Instagrams or something, we got it, uh, a, uh, a tweet or whatever the heck they call it. Uh, and it, somebody said, don't, don't buy any knives from Emerson Knives. Um, they're a bunch of anti-gun loonies. And I was like, <laughs> In the, in the vernacular of my sons and daughters, WTF, question <laughs> mark. And, and then I thought of Mike Tyson saying, you know, a lot of people say a lot of stuff when somebody isn't standing in front of them that can smack them in the face. And I thought, you know what, Mike is, he's real right about what he just said. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. But I was like, where did that come from? Because... Uh, I guess they call them trolls. They go out there and they want to say bad things about people. That's fine. But anyway, it was just funny. I, I was on my, on my thing right, right away in the morning when I got up and I go, what in the heck is that all about? So, well, today we want to talk about a few things uh, that I believe are not so much uh, solutions, if you will, but they are uh, doorways that I want to open up and make you think about, and I want to challenge you uh, about thinking about, and I want you to spread the word, if you can, uh, wherever anyone will listen. And unfortunately, uh, this, this actually is a book by me that came out about three or four weeks ago, and lo and behold, we had, we had several tragedies that have transpired right after this book came out that are exactly what the, this book is about. So I'm not here to plug the book, but I just, I could not believe that it was going to be as relevant uh, as it is. Unfortunately, it, it is relevant. And unfortunately, also, it's, it's the world that we live in. So there's certain things that we need to, to face. So without further ado, bad guy with a gun, surviving the active shooter. But I'd like to start uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you will, from everybody here. So if you stand with your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Which is another thing I would like to say about that is if you have kids in school, and you get a chance to talk to school administrators, and if your school isn't, doesn't say the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning, uh, I think it's something that you might want to bring up at a school board meeting. Don't want anybody to be indicted as a domestic terrorist, but uh, again, that's the world that we live in. I'm going to uh, start with the Warrior's Prayer. If you also bear with me. Lord, we ask that you look upon our humble brethren with your infinite grace and blessings. We ask that you give us strength through our enemies, against our enemies, when we are forsaken, and grant us courage when we falter. We ask that you stay our hand when, with your mercy when we have none. We ask that you grant us wisdom when we are in need of guidance. We ask for your light to guide us when we dwell in darkness and know not the way. We ask that you protect our brethren from harm and temptation. We ask that our faith shall stand as our unbroken shield against all that is evil. We ask that you have mercy upon our souls in the time of our death. For we know that all things are possible through faith and through the blessings, grace, and mercy of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, a little bit about that prayer. Um, that, those words were taken when I put that together from the chivalric orders that go all the way back almost a thousand years. 
and they are still relevant today and they are relevant for all warriors that go into harm's way and uh, you know some things are timeless and one of the things I'm going to stress throughout this this talk today is that there are certain things that run true and they apply all the time everywhere they apply and they don't care also very important they don't care if they apply to the bad guy or they apply to the good guy they just apply principles and universal principles uh, don't care, they just exist. So I'm going to ask you to kind of accept that from me as a, an absolute. Now, of course, there's always exceptions to every rule, but the principles that apply to human beings apply both to the bad guys and the good guys. The key is, is to understand or recognize those principles so that you can start to manipulate them to work in your favor. But we must also understand the natures of man. Now, Thucydides was a Greek philosopher who wrote about the battles in the Peloponnesian War uh, 2,500 years ago. Still relevant today, the four natures of man. Power always seeks to dominate the weak. Power will always seek to increase its strength. Power will never give up its position willfully and power will only yield to a superior power. Now you're going to see how those things play out in, in a few minutes when we start talking about the threats that we're going to face and the threats that we do face. The imminent threats that I'm going to be talking about today are the violent assaults of a terrorist attack, a school massacre, workplace violence, or just a plain crazy bastard with a gun. Uh, and you'll We'll talk about that in a second, too. But as we all know, uh, an attack by a person with a gun can occur anywhere. And it can be a mugging, it can be a robbery, it can be a follow-home uh, invasion robbery, or it can be, as we saw so tragically in Buffalo, it can be a grocery store. And of course, it's, it's really even tough to say it, or it can be a, an elementary school. Uh, and which, by the way, uh, if, if I can talk about this objectively enough to remove myself from the emotion about it, uh, the Muslim jihadist terrorists that are out there, the radical jihadists, they've had their eyes on elementary schools for, for a long time. It's just that they haven't been able to pull it off yet. But that's, that's on one of their lists of things to do, one of their bucket lists because they know what effect it has, as you now know what effect it has when something terrible happens to our most unprotected, our most innocent, and our most valuable, which is the children. So, what happens when you defund the police? Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Weak men create hard times, okay? One of the other things I think it's important without getting too political is we need strong leaders. We need people that represent us that are going to actually represent the best interest of the citizenry, okay? And I've talked about this at other times about how I believe now we exist in a country that has two countries under one roof. One is an urban civilization and the other one is a rural civilization. And per our Constitution and the way that a representative democracy is set up, neither one should ever hold sway over the other. The rural population should not hold sway over the urban, and the urban should not hold sway over the rural, because that's the way this government has been set up, and that's part of the whole uh, uh, electoral college system and everything that's been set up so that we could not have concentrated power in one area. Enough on my politics. That question, so what happens when you defund the police? Well, when something bad happens, you're on your own. And one of my good friends is um, a police officer in Minneapolis, and we fly in and out of Minneapolis because we travel north uh, a lot. And I asked him one time, I said, 
what's going on? This was after the, the George Floyd uh, demonstrations and riots. Uh, he said, Ernie, when you get off the plane and you get into your car, don't stop any place to get a, uh, at a 7-Eleven to get a soda or anything to eat. Just drive through the city as fast as you can and get out because if something happens, nobody's going to be able to come and, and be there. We're not sending units out. And I was like, wow, that's kind of a sobering thought to think of. So, you know, that's coming directly from the source. And I have a lot of friends in LAPD, and they tell me exactly the same thing. You can make the call to 911, but just keep your fingers crossed that somebody's going to show up. So you are on your own, okay, period. And that's true even if, even if these things weren't taking place, because what happens during an attack is the police or the military or anybody isn't there before it happens, because that's not where someone's going to launch an attack. They're, gonna, they're not going to fight strength against strength. They're going to go after a place where it's the most opportunistic for them to carry out their act. Well, that means it's going to be a bunch of average people on their own. And a lot can happen in a matter of only two or three minutes. So when they talk about average uh, uh, response time, two or three minutes, 10 minutes can be an eternity. What is the real truth here? Well, if you listen to the DOJ and the government, the murders are down. Now, I put that in at the end because actually there's been quite a few more murders over the last year and a half that are directly a result of the police not being able to respond. So over the last four or five years, murders have gone down. Something's working. But now they've spiked a little bit at the end because we've had basically chaos in the streets and uh, anarchy. So good old St. Augustine said, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it free and it'll defend itself. Another one of those universal statements. But here's the whole truth. Because you can lie with statistics and you can manipulate them or you can lie... A lie of omission is just the same as a lie when I'm telling a lie. I didn't take those cookies. A lie of omission is still a lie. Here's the whole truth. You can't charge someone with murder if the victim doesn't die. Well, what, what is Emerson talking about now? The real truth is violent assaults are way up. They are up by over 500% in some areas. That means I'm more likely to get attacked five times more than my grandfather would have been if we were in the same place, but in a different time. Violent assaults are going through the roof. God bless our first responders. Why are there less murders and more violent assaults? Because we have figured out how to save people from dying, okay? One very simple thing that all police officers carry right now, and of course all the responders, which is a d direct result, again, unfortunate but unintended consequences of our long and bloody conflicts, conflicts overseas, is they all carry tourniquets, okay? In the past, it was, no, 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 don't put a tourniquet on, you're going to damage the limb, cut off. Well, we found out that's best way to save somebody is stop blood flow, okay? Stop blood loss. So everybody carries tourniquets. That's one thing that's happened. Plus, we've had 40 years, 50 years of dramatic improvements in our first responders, medical uh, uh, technologies that have also developed that now they, we can bring a person back from, from death. 50 years ago, couldn't do that. So the thing is, you're way more likely to get attacked, you're way more likely to get shot, you're way more likely to get stabbed, but you're less likely to die. But the fact is, the attacks are happening. Now, in any crisis, the people who are prepared are the ones that survive. Okay? So that's what we're going to start talking about now, is what can you do to prepare? 
Well, the first thing you can do is have a plan and prepare for the worst. Now, why is that important? Because in a split second environment, when the, the difference between moving right or moving left can mean the difference between getting killed or shot or stabbed, you need to be able to face that. You need to have a pre-done plan and you need to be able to prepare for it. Now, preparing for the worst is, we know hurricanes strike the, this part of the, of the country. So you have hurricane shutters, you have houses built up uh, off the ground because you're preparing for the worst. If it never happens, great, that's a good thing. But if it does happen, you don't have to say, damn, I should have done this or I should have done that. Now, part of what we got to do is we have to look at ourselves and say, who, who am I? Who am I as a person? How am I preparing? What am I doing? How do I approach these things? Well, there's three components of awareness. The first one is acknowledgement. You have to accept that. In order to be prepared or to, or to uh, devise a plan, you have to have these three things in place. Acknowledgement. I have to be... Yeah, we do get hurricanes. Yeah, we do have mass shootings. Yeah, we do have terrorists. Yeah, we do have robberies and muggings and follow home robberies. I have to say, yes, that does happen. Number two, I also have to be able to say to myself, it can happen to me. And a lot of people, again, like I've talked to a lot of people in the, over time, we don't want to think about bad things. We don't want to have negative thoughts. It's just not fun for me to think of a tragedy or getting hurt or someone getting a terrible disease or someone dying. It's just not fun. So we, we generally, as a population or a society, we don't think about those things. So we don't face the fact or even think about, yeah, that stuff happened, but it happened over there in Texas or it happened over in, in Minneapolis or it happened over in Buffalo. It can happen anywhere, okay? So you have to also accept that it can happen to you. It can happen right here at this show. There's no, there is no rule that, I, I hope it doesn't happen, and I, I think the guys would be in a lot of a world of hurt if they tried something here, but what I'm saying is that there's no place that it can't happen. You have to accept that. And denial is the last thing that you can't have. But those are the three components. If you deny, people, again, I don't want to face the facts. I don't want to think bad thoughts. I don't want to have to think about bad things happening. I'll just, I'll just go about my life making sure I got my coffee in the morning and my TV is working at night when I get home. Okay? Those are the people that really do get caught off guard. Those are the guys that don't prepare their house for the, um, the hurricane. And I live out, at least half my time, I live in California, and we have earthquakes. Now, there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, that'll never happen. I'm telling you, we have earthquakes. We have them every single day. Some of them are real tiny, but once in a while a big one comes. I can't even tell you that I'm prepared because I don't want people that aren't prepared knocking on my door going, I'm out of water because they didn't prepare. And another thing that you, you should be aware of too is people say, how long can I survive um, in a crisis event? I'm not talking about a shooting, but like a natural disaster. And I always tell them, look, you can survive until you run out of water. That's it. After that, there's really no chance of survival. You can have food, you can have all that other stuff, but if you run out of water, you've got a couple days, three or four days, and then you're going to die. So if you have nothing else in an emergency kit, uh, you should have water, 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 water. I can go two weeks without eating anything, and I'm not going to die but I can't go two weeks without having to drink water. So what do we do? Well, we start with education. Well, the first thing we have to understand is how do I prepare a plan if I don't know who I'm preparing it for, okay? Why does a football team practice? Why do they have films? Why do they have scouts? Why do they have people go to the, to the, to the other teams and see what are their strong points? What are their weak points? Who are we gonna be facing Friday night? Well, they need to know the enemy. They need to know the opponent. Because then I can prepare a plan that's going to fit or dovetail to what I'm most likely to face when I, when I have to go head-to-head -head with them. So, 
one problem with the study of the enemy is this. The enemy is not like us, okay? When you, we live in a, a, what I would consider to be generally a normal world. I could talk to anyone in here and we all have pretty much the same idea of what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. That's our normal. When you have, and especially when I reference the crazy bastard with a gun, you can't put normal on a crazy person. And a lot of these people will find out what are the commonalities in these, these mass shooters and all that. One of the main things they have is most of them are mentally ill, one way or another. So we can't look at this and go, why did this happen? How did this happen? What do we got to do? Thinking in, a, in terms of our normal, we can't put normal on abnormal, okay? You have to look at the enemy through their eyes and see what their motivations are, why they do things, what do they do. So you've got to be aware of the bias for normalcy. Now that's funny because when something happens, let's say in a mall, and the soccer mom is interviewed later and she goes, yeah, I heard, uh, I thought it was balloons popping. And you talk to someone else and they go, oh man, I thought it was, a, I thought it was the backfire of a car. That's their bias for normalcy on a situation that was actually gunfire. And I'll tell you what, a Marine just back from Afghanistan deployment, he didn't think he heard balloons popping, and he didn't think he heard a backfire of a car. He heard gunshots, okay? And so, again, it's like me. If I hear a loud bang, the first thing that pops into my head, somebody's got a gun, somebody shot a gun. I can dial it back if it was somebody dropping a, a big piece of lumber or something, but, you know, that's just me. So, we have to start looking at what we do to train to combat stuff like this. The training consists of soft skills and hard skills. Soft skills are what we're doing today, right now, which is just talking, learning, educating ourselves about the enemy, about what happens. Hard skills are the training. That's you uh, going to the range, uh, working out, taking boxing lessons, whatever, whatever that would happen to be. So the skill sets that you're going to develop are education, which is soft, training, which is hard, and then the execution, which is the third part of the, of the triangle that you'd be looking at, is the execution of all of those events in response to an attack, which would be both hard and soft skills applied as a result of your training. Now, here's something that's important when I talk about those universal principles. Every single attack, attack that there is consists of these things. The ways, the means, and the intent. The ways are the process of an attack. How is that attack propagated? Is it an IED? Is it a suicide uh, bomber? Is it someone with a rifle in a, in a, in a mall? Uh, is it a chemical uh, biological weapon detonated or, or set off on a train. That's the process. The means are the weapons. What are the weapons that are used most of the time in these attacks? We're going to identify those in a, in a moment. Then you have what is the intent of the attack. So it could be this one, insanity, which happens to be very, very common in the things that we're going to talk about as far as schools and, and malls and all that. But it could be someone who's angry at someone. It could be a criminal act. It could be a political uh, act, which terrorism would fall under. Uh, it could be a religious act, which also terrorism could fall under. And it could be just plain old revenge, which covers quite a few of those uh, topics. Now, part of that, once we've identified the ways, the means, and the intent, every single attack that exists or takes place follows a process. It starts and it finishes, but it goes through every single one of these. There are no exceptions to this. This is a universal principle. Number one, there's a selection of the target, okay? Number two, there's surveillance of the target. Number three, they prepare a plan, just like we're gonna be preparing a plan. Fourth is, they have to approach the target they have to be within a, a distance that they can actually carry out the, the act. And then the last one, of course, is the actual attack. 
That's the execution part. Now we're talking, this is the bad guy that we're looking at here. So they always select a target. Now criminals, they call it scanning. And they can look at a crowd of people as they walk by and they can pick people out that would be in a, a potential victim in a matter of seconds. And it's just like any predator, and we, have, we also have to look at the, the predator-prey uh, relationship. Uh, we being the prey, them being the predator, they follow the same exact principles as a predator in nature follows. They need concealment, they need cover, they need ambush, they need surprise, and they need a weak target, okay? They're not going to attack the 255-pound lineman from the Atlanta whatever the football team is here, <laughs> but they will attack the old lady and, and deck her and knock her to the ground to take the $15 and change that she's got in her pocket. But if you know all of these things are absolutes that are prerequisites to any attack being carried out, you can stop the attack at any one of these points, okay? Of course. This is the best place to stop it. Now, every terrorist attack that has taken place, here in the United States anyway, uh, when, they, when they uncover a plot or whatever you want to call it, and they round these guys up, they'll find videos, they'll find pictures, they'll find notes. That's what they're doing. They're, they're taking pictures of a bridge. They're taking pictures of, of uh, uh, routes that someone takes. Or I mean, it's, if you think about it, we do the same exact thing. If we're going to go snatch a bad guy off the streets of Baghdad, we have to do the same exact thing. We have to select the target, surveil the target, prepare a plan, approach that target, and then attack it. So again, universal principles, they don't care where they apply. But we have to think about one thing. Are you a sheep or a sheepdog? And as my good friend, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, uh, is, has so eloquently defined the role of the protectors and those that need protected. So you got to make a decision right now. And again, I don't make any judgment call on whether you are a sheep or a, or a, or a sheepdog because that's the way our societies have always broken down. No matter what, from the beginning of time, there have always been people, when they hear or when they sense danger, they run towards the danger, and there are those that don't run towards the danger. It's not courage or cowardice. It's just the way that it breaks down. There have always been warriors, and there have always been the people that the warriors protect, period. Okay? It's not a, it, again, don't misread me. It's not a judgment about courage or cowardice. It's just the way it is. That's why we still have so many young men volunteering to join our military. Those are the people that are running towards danger. Same thing with police departments. Same thing with firemen. Same thing with EMTs. It's just in our nature, I guess. Warrior mentality, another thing that you have to be able to think of and develop in your internal psyche is, I will give my life to protect and defend. A warrior knows, every day a police officer or, or a soldier knows that they may face a deadly threat and it may be the last time that they wake up in the morning but they still go out. They have no fear of death, okay? They don't, they don't try to die, but they're willing to put themselves on the line to protect the rest of us. You need ferocious resolve. I will never quit and I will never surrender. I will never run out of gas. And very important part, I will do anything to stop the threat from doing harm anything. Now, we're going to talk about that in detail in a moment. We also need to know that there are the sheep and the sheepdogs. We are the guardians. And I must say, uh, about the people that come to something like this, I think m everyone in this room right now is probably a sheepdog and a guardian. Otherwise, you wouldn't have an interest in listening to what I have to say. Very important thing also, bias for action, okay? You need to be ready to go in a heartbeat, all right? You can't sit there in a fugue state thinking, what are, what's going on? What do I do? How do I do this? What, what should I do? How do I get out of the line of fire? Whatever. That's part of that having a plan and, and uh, knowing about what happens in these environments that we're going to talk about also in a moment.
bias for action. You have to act quickly. The people that make decisions quickly are also the ones that survive. Also, capability versus capacity. We're going to go into detail on that in a moment. We train to have all these skills, but you need to be able to make a decision to use those skills. And some people delude themselves by training to do all of these things, but in the moment of crisis, fall short of being able to execute. Now, what is moral clarity? The last one. Well, moral clarity is what allows you to have the ability to take those skills, your capabilities, the skills that you learn and train to do, and the capacity, which is the decision to use those skills against another human being. Now, we're talking about mayhem and, and death and destruction, okay? We're talking about taking another human life. Because understand something, this talk and what I'm discussing right now is when you are faced with imminent deadly threat. Okay? We're facing an attack. This isn't me squaring off against some guy in a, in a bar because he slapped my, girl, my, my wife's uh, rear end. Okay? Uh, this is about when somebody, when, when you hear pop, pop, pop. Okay? That's what we're talking about right now. So, what gives you the ability to use your capability, which is the capacity? What gives you that? Because we're not bad guys, we're good guys. It, doesn't, it isn't in my nature to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go out and really mess somebody up. That's not who we are. We're the good guys. But the moral clarity, in my world anyway, my, my way of looking at life, is that that sixth commandment, which, re, which people have a lot of times defined as thou shall not kill, is actually thou shall not commit murder. Now, Killing somebody, thou shalt not kill, that's an unjustified um, taking of another human life. This is, murder is a, an unjustified uh, taking of another human life. We're talking about a bad person who is killing other people. In my mind, and I have perfect moral clarity about it, I will grind that person into the ground. I'll shoot him 25 times if, it, if that's what it takes to make sure that they stop shooting children, or old ladies, or people in a mall, or in a grocery store. But I have to have that clarity, because there are times when people hesitate, and scientifically, and, and there's been studies that, it, again, David Grossman's the world's leading expert on this, that there were actually soldiers in a lot of conflicts that would not fire their guns at the enemy who is charging at them, because it's not in our nature to kill other people. Okay, and uh, the military spent <laughs> thousands of hours and, and years of experience trying to understand how do we get that solved so that our soldiers, when they're sent into harm's way, that they're going to act as soldiers do when they're being attacked. Now, one thing I want you to understand also is if you're in a, if a school shooting, a mall shooting, whatever it happens to be, um, Law enforcement, unfortunately, and maybe it's because it's a civilian environment uh, that has a lot of administrators involved in, in a lot of the definitions and, and uh, decisions that are made about how to respond to these things. They've, I don't think they really understand a combat environment is a combat environment. Okay, It doesn't matter that it's not on, the, on a hillside in Afghanistan that it's down here in a mall in Atlanta. It's a combat environment. If you're shooting bullets at me, or you're killing people, and, I, and I'm shooting back, or we're assaulting the, uh, an area where we need, to, we need to take a bad guy out, that's combat. That is combat. There's no difference. That's why the active shooter thing and all that, we try and, geez, they put all these different definitions on things. It's like, dude, it's a bad guy with a gun. Just like it is over in Iraq, if someone's shooting at you, it's combat. It's on, and the principles are exactly the same. Now, I got it. There's escalation of force rules. There's justification of force, all of that good stuff. That, and a civilian environment maybe need to be adhered to, but I'm telling you right now, when you're in a room and someone's doing bad things to other people, all bets are off. My opinion on it is do, you need to do whatever it takes 
deal with the fallout later. Okay. The hard skills that you would be training in are fitness, conditioning, and functional strength. We won't spend any time on that because uh, I'll just say you need to be you need to be in shape. Strong people are harder to kill, and they're they're generally more useful, as a friend of mine once told me. Combat fighting skills, whether it's firearms training, whether it's martial arts stuff, boxing, wrestling, I don't care what it is. These are part of the hard skills that we're talking about. Now, I'm not going to tell everybody they got to go out and get ready to fight in the UFC, but by God, if you got to go to if you got to go hand to hand with somebody who because you you've attacked him and he's killing kids. It's better if you know how to fight than if you've never thrown a punch in your life. And the skill at arms, again, goes along with all of those martial arts and or um, hot weapons training. Okay? So, one of the things that's also important is you need to be able to make decisions. You need to be able to make them fast. Okay? Rapid thinking. What is rapid thinking? Rapid thinking is a result of your training because... If you've done this, if you've done scenario training, or if you've even thought about what would I do if a guy comes through that door right now? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because I'm telling you, it's, it's a weird thing. You may look at me and go, wow, that guy's kind of kooky. I think about that stuff all the time. Uh, just because this is what I do. This is, this is me thinking, what do I do if something bad happens? Okay? So that when something happens, I'm in a mall, I'm in a, in a coffee shop, and a guy walks in and he's all disheveled or he's got a hoodie on and I'm not profiling. Yes, I am. Uh, and he looks sketchy. Right away I'm thinking, okay, what if this guy pulls out a gun? What am I going to do? Where's my family? Where's my exit? Where's cover? How can, I, how can I be ready if something bad happens? That allows me to make a quick decision because I've already, I've already pre-gamed it. Okay? or rapid thinking, that gives me that. But quick decisions are the result of the plan. That's what I was just describing, actually. I got a little ahead of myself. If I have a plan, then I've already figured out what I'm going to do when it, when it happens, okay? So I don't have to sit there in that fugue state going, uh, 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 okay? Because, man, time goes by real quick. People who are prepared survive. Universal principle, natural disasters, Combat environments, why do we pre prepare our soldiers so, why, why do they train, 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 drill, 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 so they're prepared, okay? There was an old quote from, the, from a Spartan warrior where he's, I can't remember it exactly, but he said, look, their soldiers, they train, they train for 100 days. We're Spartans, we always train because we're Spartans. The key to survival is the ability to make crucial decisions quickly and correctly. Those are the guys who make it out, and that was told to me by an Air Force survival instructor. Why don't we put guys through survival school? So it isn't the first time they're facing this stuff when it's happening and they have a plan and they have uh, the ability to act quickly and make good decisions. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. How true that is. I am never going to allow my enemy to regroup. To And we're, we'll talk about that in a minute also, about when is the best time to escape a hostage situation or a, or a takeover situation. Uh, George Patton, another one of my heroes. We get to the part about execution that we were looking at. What do you do when the devil knocks on your door? Okay. Now we're going to start getting into the little bit of the, the meat and potatoes. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. He was a Democrat. My oh my, how things have changed. He was also a war hero, hero who, who swam many miles taking a wounded comrade with a rope in his mouth and swimming across the Pacific Ocean out there to uh, save the guys after his PT boat was uh, rammed by a Japanese uh, destroyer. What are the countermeasures to violence? Okay. They are dictated also by a set of universal principles 
that I define as the protocols of action. This is what you need to do when the horse manure hits the fan. You need to detect, number one, evade, you could call that escape if you want, barricade, and engage. And you approach these in this order, okay? Best thing to do is detect. How do we detect, okay? I think some of you have probably heard the term situational awareness. That's, without get, I could write a whole book on just situational awareness, and some people have. Uh, you might wanna just look that up. Situational awareness in, in simple terms is being aware of everything in your surrounding environment, and that's 360 and up above and below, at least for 25 to 30 feet, probably in a civilian situation, because in that 25 or 30 feet, in a couple of footsteps, that person can reach out and touch me, okay? So I gotta be aware of who's in there. In fact, I've got situa situational awareness switched on right now, because again, if I'm in a public environment, somebody in this room could get to me if they had evil intent in their, hand, in their mind, but I'm on it, okay? It's being aware, your radar. Don't walk, in. It's, it's, here's a real good example. Don't walk into a biker bar at one o'clock in the morning on a Saturday to grab a beer, okay? That's not a good decision. Okay, there's chances are something might happen, and I'm never, I never want to put myself in harm's way, either willing, willingly or unknowingly, okay? The only time I have to do that is if I have to do that. Uh, common sense, again, don't walk into the biker bar. Very important aspect, as defined by Gavin DeBecker, The Gift of Fear. If you don't have a book by Gavin DeBecker, The Gift of Fear, get the book. It's required reading in my family, and it has been. I've read it three or four times. Gavin DeBecker, DeBecker was the threat analysis uh, expert for three or four president's uh, terms. So he knows what he's talking about. And he said, gut feel is your number one protective device that you have. If it doesn't feel right, it's not right, period. Okay? We all have it, but we also have a brain and our brain overrides our gut feel. It rationalizes things and it talks us out of listening to what's going on here. It's, it's almost our sixth, sixth sense, if you will. But it's always on duty and it's, all, its only job is to protect us from harm. If it doesn't feel right, it ain't right, okay? But you gotta, you gotta take the brain out of the equation. Who is the world's greatest fighter? The fighter who never has to fight, okay? How can I say that? Because if I have got myself to a point where I can avoid a fight through situational awareness, the detect part of this situation that I'm describing, I can get out of harm's way, save my family, save other people, and never have to go to those next steps, okay? When, when is the best time to escape? Let's say a bank uh, takeover robbery. You're in line in a bank, a guy comes in, boom, this is a robbery or any place. When's the best time to escape? Right now, okay? Because here's some things that are going on. He doesn't have control of the situation yet. As time marches forward, second by second, he's taking more, 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 more control of that environment. Everybody over here, down on your knees, blah, 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 whatever they're trying to do to you. And in a hostage situation, even in a, in a terrorist event, is the same exact thing. The best time to get away is while it's happening because I'm telling you right now, a lot of these guys are not trained shooters. Some of them are very good, and we'll, we'll talk about wh how they get to be good in a moment, but it's much harder to hit a moving target, I'll tell you that right now. So if you're running away, it's gonna be harder for him to shoot at you than if you're standing there still like a deer in the headlights, okay? That's just common sense. So, evade. First, we've detected it. We've removed ourselves from the event. If the event starts to take place and we weren't aware that it was gonna take place, what do we do next? We have to escape. And that's what I'm talking about. Again, what is the best, best self-defense 
technique that exists. What has kept human beings alive throughout history? The number one thing, the number one self-defense technique that exists. Running. Yes, absolutely, 100%. The best self-defense technique that exists. Running, getting out of harm's way, okay? Evading is always, or escaping is always your first choice. It works when you detect or preempt by recognizing that attack process. Something's going on here. Using your situational awareness and gut feel, and it always works best the earlier you execute it during the attack process. Now, that's, as we progress down that list, that's not saying, well, we've gone past my ability to escape. No, 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 no. Every single moment, you're looking for a way to escape every single moment. Even though you might be getting all the way down to where you have to engage the enemy, you still are looking for a, a moment to escape. Because anytime you engage in conflict or combat with someone, there's the chance that you, you can get killed, and there's a chance he can get killed. But if I can avoid that any way, shape, or form, that's the best thing that I want to do. Now, that may not be true in the case of a, of a uh, military operation or a police officer who can't run away, if you will, because they need to stay there to protect the people that are in harm's way. So, have a plan. Best time to escape is in the beginning. Correct interpretation of events. It's not... It's not balloons popping, okay? If I hear balloons popping in a theater, who brings balloons into a theater? Come on. Bias for action. You need to act quickly. Those who move live. Those who don't die. Distance is your friend. And that's that best self-defense technique there is. So then we move into barricade. I didn't detect it. I, now I'm stuck in this room. Let's say there's no alternate exits out of here. Boom, someone's come through it, we're in a schoolroom or whatever, you need to barricade, okay? That's putting something between you and the enemy. Now, concealment, we need to understand also the difference between concealment and cover. Concealment is hiding. That's like hiding behind some bushes, okay? Staying out of, out of view. It's not wrong, but cover conceals and protects behind a desk, um, behind a door, in a closet, okay? There's a little more protection from that. But a barricade conceals, covers, protects, and denies access. So as you know, and as if you've heard, if you study any of these events, um, I think some of the teachers actually took those kids in Texas and got them into a bathroom. Good move, good move, okay? Why, why is that a good move? Well, now you've put them in an, an environment where it's easy for someone to come in there and they're all in there. Well, barricade that door. If you need to hold the door, even if someone's shooting through the door or whatever you can put in place to stop that from happening, bathroom's not a bad place to be, okay? Why do they say, when a, when a, where I'm from, it's, there's a lot of tornadoes. Uh, where do I go in a tornado if I don't have a, a shelter under the house or anything? You go in the bathroom and get in the bathtub. Okay, it's the strongest room in the house. It's got cement on the walls, it's got tile. Uh, it's a good place to be. Same thing with a public bathroom. They usually have metal doors. Uh, you can get in there and in some way, if you, if you have to. Again, here's the other thing that takes place. In, in any of those mass shooting events, it's happening fast, okay? The shooter isn't gonna shoot what he can't see. He's only gonna shoot people that are right here in front of him that he can see. Okay, that's the way that plays out. So if you're not in the line of sight, chances are he's going to go past. Now we'll talk about some of that stuff in, in conjunction with school safety in a second. So your action is, if you can't escape, put something between you and the shooter. And also, again, get as far away as possible. Hiding in a bathroom a quarter of a block away on a school campus from where the shooting's taking place is, is actually safer than hiding in a bathroom 10 feet from where the shooting's taking place. So the, these principles apply, but you've got you've to use them in conjunction. They're not separate. They're not one, then two, then three. They're layered so that they can all be accessed and used at the same time. 
in a room, you lock or jam the door. In a schoolroom, you throw every single thing that exists. We hear gunfire out there. If we're not running out to confront that guy and there's a bunch of people in here that are going to stay in, in shelter in place, your job would be to take every single one of these chairs and pile it in front of that door. Every book, every backpack, everything that you possibly can. Because again, think about what a predator is doing. The principle does not change. When he comes by and he tries to push the door open because he wants to see if there's kids in that room and he can't do it, boom, he just goes on to the next room. Now that's unfortunate, and people will say that's cold, hard, calloused way to look at things, but by God, I can only save the people that I can save. Okay? Somebody unfortunately might pay the price, but if I'm in charge of saving the people that are under my, my care as a teacher, uh, I gotta protect them first, okay? I gotta do what I can do. They're, they're, and that's when we talk about, um, when someone enters a room, there's a better place to be. If you think about a school, let's say, uh, most of the schools that I've worked with uh, are on their ground level schools, all right? Now in, in the big cities, some of them are multi-levels, but that's, that's not a bad thing either because most of those schools have, have limited access and egress. Uh, on a flat campus like where I'm from, uh, you can walk in, you can park anywhere around the school and just walk onto the, the school grounds. But most of those schools have more or less causeways with the rooms along the sides and then there's a series of windows along there, okay? So in a school, what I've told them is you need to have some way to bam, pull an emergency cord and let a cloth um, uh, curtain drop so that as this guy's running down this, he's, he can't look in. If I look in, I'm a bad guy. Again, sounds bad. I'm thinking like the bad guy. If I look in and I see kids in there and that's what I'm trying to do, that's where I'm going to go. If I run by and I can't see anything, I'm going to the, I'm just going to go by. They're not meticulous. It's not like a SEAL team that's going to that's gonna clear a room okay, or clear a, a building. They're not looking on everything. They're, they're, they're just going where there's people they can kill, okay? In that position, if you don't have a curtain that you can drop, where's the best place to be? It's right at that window underneath, down along that floor right here. If this was a whole bunch of windows, because there's usually a, um, a bookshelf right there, a guy can't look through a window and he's not going to go through the window and look down two feet over at people that are in shelter down here underneath, okay? So again, there's just certain things that people need to be aware of. And that's why it's, it's, it's important for us to talk to teachers because those are the people that are more likely to deal with this than, than I am. In other words, um, if, if some crazy guy is going to attack something, He's probably not going to come to my house. He's probably not going to come to where I work. It's going to be a school, a mall, or something like that. But as, as teachers, who are the ones that would be the first responders, if you will, uh, they need to be made aware of some of these things so that they have a plan. Just like we practiced in the old... I'm, I'm from the, the time when uh, we were under threat of nuclear attack from, from Russia. We had... We had uh, fallout drills and nuclear attack drills, which was like getting under your desk, which I don't, I don't know how, long, how much good that would have done with a nuclear bomb going off, but we practiced that. Same thing with fire drills. Why do you practice a fire drill? So that when it happens, everybody kind of knows what to do, and we're not all running around here like chickens with our heads cut off. Universal principle. When the bad guy's reacting, he is no longer acting. When he is reacting, he is no longer acting. Now think about that. Why is that important? Because he can do whatever he wants until he meets an opposition force. Okay? In boxing, one of the, one of the best techniques that exist is the flurry. Boom, 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 boom. And you'll see it happen. And the other boxer who is as skilled, same skill sets, two boxes in the ring, the other guy covers. He's no longer offensive. He is 100% defensive because he's being overwhelmed by an offensive flurry. Now, what's the standard uh, operating procedure for the Marine, a Marine platoon when it, 
runs into an ambush situation. Run and hide. You will counterattack with overwhelming firepower to stop the bad guy from being able to do whatever the hell he wants to, or the bad guys. The principle is exactly the same. If he is reacting to when the police show up or when the, a teacher grabs a pipe and runs up and starts wailing at the guy, even though he's got a rifle or whatever, he's no longer killing kids. Now he's reacting to that counterattack, okay? And that is the part of the protocols which is engage. That's the last choice when it's you and him. Now, as a teacher, we ask a lot of our teachers. We ask them to teach our children. We ask them to watch our children. We also ask, ask them to protect our children. This may be the teacher against a guy with a gun, whether it's a pistol. And, and one of the other things that's common too is you've got to understand about the bad guys, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I forgot to bring this up. They usually have more than one weapon. They're, and most of the times, it's a long gun, but they will also have extra ammunition, extra magazines. Most of the time, they have a pistol. They have a backpack that's full of stuff. They have knives, whatever it, hap it happens to be. Most of the time, the attack is a single perpetrator, although there are exceptions to that. Um, Columbine was multiple uh, students. The other thing that's common is they have a prior history with that environment. They're a former student, or they were being bullied, or they didn't like the grades. We've had attacks at college campuses because a student was pissed off that a professor didn't give him an A, but gave him a B. There is a prior relationship going on. It's almost always a white male, very, very seldom is there a female involved? But there are times when women are involved. The attacks in Paris involved a, a woman with a suicide uh, vest. The attacks at San Bernardino was a man and a wife. But it's usually a male. He has a prior uh, history with the environment. He, he's armed with a, with a rifle. He's mentally ill. There is something going on, schizophrenia, depression, flat out crazy bastard with a gun my definition, but those are the commonalities of that, of that attacker. So that's who you're going to be facing. Nobody's going to come in and hurt these, if they rob us, nobody's going to hurt these, these checkers, because I was like, God damn it, I can't wait. I can't wait to throw that can of soup at somebody as hard as I possibly can. Um, last thing is also, carry a gun and then use it, okay? Um, I'll just say it, I'm armed 24-7, 24-7, I carry a gun, you guys are going to think I'm a weirdo, I carry a gun in my house, it's a concealed gun, there's a, there's a holster that I really, really like, and I can't remember the name of it, but it tucks down inside the pants, you'd never know I had a, a weapon, period, but, and it's super comfortable but it's with me all the time, okay? I don't care about CCWs. I was born with a CCW, okay? I am an American. I have the right to protect myself, to protect my family, and to pr protect people that are in harm's way, period. No question in my mind, all right? And, and be ready to use the gun. That's that moral clarity. Because what does it take? It takes a gun to stop a gun, okay? 99% of the time, 99% of the time, it takes a gun to stop a gun, okay? And when the, when the cavalry finally does arrive, that's when that person stops shooting innocent people. Because now he's taken fire from an assault force, whether it's SWAT team or police, or if we're in a terrorist event, uh, military or whatever, the minute that he's taken fire, 
he stopped shooting at innocent people because now he's dealing with bullets coming his direction. The other thing that's common with, with these uh, attackers, and I forgot to mention this too, is they're resigned to die, okay? And that's terrorists and or crazy bastard with a gun. They're resigned to die. Terrorists want to go to heaven. Be my guest. I'll give you a one-way ticket on that one. Students that were bullied, schizophrenics, crazy guys with guns, they're there, they know they're gonna die. No matter what, they know they're gonna, this ain't gonna end well. That's why a lot of them commit suicide. If they're not shot by the police, they commit suicide. Now that little, I can't really swear. The person that perpetrated those attacks in um, uh, Texas, I believe, had the gun to his, to his throat, but then chickened out and didn't do it. Now, again, your actions must support, be supported by these mentalities. That bias for action, so you gotta act quickly. No hesitation, quick thinking, quick decisions. Have those plans, have a, have a contingency in place, okay? Think about it, and, and I know, Chris, you're here, you're, you're, you're um, Army Ranger, 30 years. 30 years. How many times did you plan a mission and go through every detail every moment, every possible contingency, you had backup plans for backup plans for backup plans because you want to do two things. You want to accomplish the mission, get the bad guy, and you want to bring your guys back home safe. It's all about planning, having a plan, being able to look at these things, things that I've described a little bit, and be able to make sure that you have done everything you can to help mitigate any kind of harm that's gonna take place. You have gotta have no mercy. I don't look at a bad guy as another person. They're an obstacle and I'm just gonna blow through it. That's my mentality because I'm not gonna humanize them. Now people have criticized me about that and there's arguments on both sides of that. For me, it's easier to just think that's a fucking paper target. That's a paper target and I'm gonna shoot it. I don't care, I don't, at that point, I don't care. Ferocious resolve, willing to do anything. This illustrates almost everything that I've been talking about here very precisely. I just love this, I love this film clip. I'm gonna have you watch it for a second. Now, what happened there? Guy's taking a stroll with his wife or girl. These two thugs, whatever the hell their reason for doing it, you could tell, if, and I've looked at this clip a hundred times or more. He's aware of those guys because you see him turn his head and kind of look at them as he gets closer to them and then one of them goes like this and hits the gal in the face. What happens? He switched on. He switched on before he reaches where they reached out and touched her. Bias for action. Immediately, counterattacks, boom. Overwhelming firepower. These guys had no idea that they just poked a bear. So let's look at that again. And he doesn't give up until the threat is neutralized. Now, that wasn't a deadly force encounter, so he didn't stomp the guy's head when he was on the ground. He only did exactly what he needed to do. And then and, and when I've worked with the Brits, they have, a, they have a thing called the switch. They're always talking about the switch. Switch on, switch off. Now, what do I mean by the switch? Well, think about this. Stereo. If I go over and turn the stereo on and then turn up the volume, that's the way most people do it. But in an environment where I have now, my gut feel is going on, my situational awareness is turned on, 
my switch is turned on. The difference is I go over to the stereo, I turn the volume up full, and then I push the power button. You've got to be able to train yourself to go from easy going, relaxed, bam, and you're in action. And it's full on. You, you, there's no ramping up in a deadly force encounter. This isn't deadly force, but it, it illustrates the, exactly what I'm talking about. That guy went from zero to hero and then back to zero. And then they just walked on. I want you to look at that one more time. Bam, ready, wham, 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 wham. Boom, 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 two against one. Boom, boom, boom. This guy's on Queer Street up here. He's got, he doesn't know where the hell he is. <laughs> Bang, turns around, checks this guy. We're good, let's go, honey. And these guys are like, dude, we gotta rethink our plan here because this ain't working good for us. Waiting for the cavalry. If you embrace that idea, you'll be waiting for an eternity. You are on your own, okay? God love the police and God love everybody that comes to the rescue, but there is time involved in that. Unless there's a police officer, an off-duty officer, uh, or someone of that ilk uh, on the scene, who are the real first responders? Us, we are, we have to be, okay? Because that's now, we're the sheepdogs, that's our job. That's why we are born onto this earth, is to be that person, to be that guy, to be that gal. And, and I've seen and, and read after action reports about sometimes it's the 52-year-old, 102-pound woman that steps up to the plate. It doesn't have to be a guy. It has to be a warrior. And warrior don't care where it goes. Could be a gal, could be a guy, could be a 14 year old kid. But remember this, there's bad warriors also. And some of them are pretty damn good at what they do. So being aware training, just taking the, the responsibility that I am going to do this. I don't care about what happens to me. I, I have a job in life. By God, I'll be sitting at the right hand of the, of the father and son. If, if, if that's... If faith is a big deal. Faith in your skills, faith in your ability, faith in the teammates that you have with you, faith in a cause... You talk about survivors that survive terrible things, uh, uh, shipwrecks and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. One of the big things they have is they have faith. And it doesn't have to be a religious faith, for those of you that might not be of that ilk, but it has to be a faith that you're going to make you're going to make it through no matter what. No matter what. And if and if you talk uh, to people that are in combat in in the military and all that, most of the soldiers will tell you, a lot of times, the most important thing to them was they're not going to let something bad happen to their buddy. They will give their life to protect their buddy. And that's coming both ways. That's a two-way street. Well, it's got to be that same mentality. It's tough, to, it's tough to talk about the stuff that's going on with the, with the kids. and the. So in the end, no matter what, you are always armed. You are always armed because you are a warrior. And a warrior is never unarmed. You can never say, well, I don't have a weapon. Excuse me? I'm the weapon. Anything else is just a tool. I'm a carpenter. It's easier to build a house if I have a hammer in my hand, got it, or a saw, but I'm still a carpenter. I am a warrior. That is your mentality. 
So you are never unarmed. I had a man tell me one time who was a very, very, he knew of what he spoke. Let's just say that. And he told me, he said, Ernie, you've got to understand something. You have far more to fear from a dangerous man than you do from a dangerous weapon. Take the weapon away, what are you still left with? A dangerous, deadly man. You've still got to deal with that. You need to be the dangerous, deadly man. But what has happened throughout history with the warrior class in every society? We are held to a higher standard. We are held to a code of conduct. It has always been that. The, the code of Bushido for the samurai soldiers, the chivalric codes of honor with our knights, Everything that, that separates us from the bad guys is that a warrior on that side and a warrior on this side, we fight for the cause of good. We fight to protect. And we will, because what separates someone with a lot of skills in, in death and destruction, uh, if we didn't have those codes, we're just as bad as the, as the bad guys. But we live to a different code. We're here to protect. We're here to sacrifice ourselves to protect those who need protecting. And again, I've already asked this question, but how many first responders are in this room? I want to see every damn hand because that's what it's going to come down to. These are my commandments, personal ones, protect the weak, defend the innocent, stand up to tyranny and unjust behavior, take responsibility for your actions, be prepared to accept the consequences, honor friendship with loyalty, stand tall in the face of adversity, ask more of yourself than others, never do anything without a purpose, never do anything that's useless, and be honest in your intentions and actions with everyone you meet. And that concludes our talk today. I hope that I've opened some doors, made you look at some things. I urge you, urge you to pass on any kind of information that you might have gleaned here to anyone that you can, because it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, what used to happen once every five years is now happening every five days, okay? It's just the just the nature of the beast right now. So I thank you all for coming. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me.